Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. This afternoon, Monday, February 6th, we will be considering the role of law schools in promoting discussion, civility, and the pursuit of truth. This program is the first in a series on the state of our law schools, which we are co-sponsoring with the Professional Responsibility and Legal Education Practice Group. We will focus today on how the law school environment is preparing students for work in law firm private practice. I'm Alita Cass, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Federalist Society and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project, an initiative addressing new challenges and questions involving freedoms of thought, conscience, and expression. Today's discussion addresses an important question for the Freedom of Thought Project, how law schools might support and encourage respectful discussion and debate in the pursuit of truth. But often when we think of challenges to freedom of thought on campus, we're concerned primarily with how behavior or policies might affect the students as students while on campus. Today, we're taking a longer view to consider the campus culture for discussion and debate in light of the law school's purpose, which is at least in part to teach effective lawyering and prepare students for successful careers. What are the lessons and skills students are absorbing and carrying with them into their roles as young attorneys? Are law schools doing a good job of shaping the next generation of the legal profession? And what could they be doing better? We're very fortunate to have with us Judge Ho to help explore these questions and moderate today's discussion. Judge Ho is well known to many of you in the audience. He currently sits on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Prior to joining the bench, in January of 2018, he was partner and co-chair of the Appellate and Constitutional Law Practice Group in Gibson Dunn, and also served three years as the Solicitor General of Texas. As always, please note that the expressions of opinion offered today are those of the experts on today's panel. We encourage our audience to submit questions for our panelists through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Q&A feature, not the chat feature. After our speakers have offered their opening remarks, our moderator will turn to submitted questions to direct the panel discussion. With that, thank you for being with us today. Judge Ho, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alita. I am honored to moderate today's important panel discussion on the state of American law schools. Our topic today is discussion, coercion, and the pursuit of truth, the role of law schools in promoting civility. In a recent episode of his hit HBO TV show, comedian Bill Maher compared the environment on college campuses to the communist revolution in China. He analogized woke revolutionaries, that's his term, to the Red Guard. And he mentioned specifically one recent controversy involving law professor Jason Kilborn at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Is that a fair or unfair description of what's going on on our nation's law school campuses? And what happens on campus? Does it stay on campus? Or does it spill over and affect the legal profession? We have an all-star panel today to help us sort this all out. I'm going to introduce each of them very briefly because you already know them and because we're anxious to hear their thoughts. I will introduce them in the order they're gonna speak. Uh, we'll try to have a good lively discussion afterwards. And uh, as Lita mentioned, we certainly welcome questions from the audience in the tradition of the society. Uh, I will try to ask as many of them as I possibly can. First, we have David Latt, founder of Original Jurisdiction, who writes very frequently on these topics that we're discussing today. Renee Lerner is the Donald Philip Rothschild Research Professor at George Washington University Law School. Eugene Volick is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. Jay Edelson is founder and CEO of Edelson PC. And Paul Clement is partner at Clement and Murphy. David, we'll hear from you first. Thank you so much, Judge Ho. Thank you, Alita. And thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting this discussion about a very important topic. I'm going to speak briefly because I too am actually eager to hear from my co-panelists. 
as law professors and as practicing lawyers, they are much more in the trenches on these issues than I am. I am merely a journalist and commentator who covers these issues. As Judge Ho mentioned, I write a newsletter on the Substack platform called Original Jurisdiction. And when I originally started this newsletter, I expected to be talking about law firms, law schools, legal education. But because of recent events, a very large portion of my coverage has actually been focused on issues of ideological diversity, free speech, and civil discourse within the legal profession. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with a lot of the recent episodes from the past year or so. I suspect that is why many of you have joined this webinar. So I'm going to be brief and just talk about a couple of incidents that I think do shed light on the situation and the challenges that law schools and legal employers are facing. Uh, both of these incidents happened last year, and I'm going to actually close my opening remarks with perhaps some reasons for optimism, but let me talk about these two events first. So a year ago, a little uh, less than a year ago on March 1, Ilya Shapiro, who was at the time a lecturer in law at Georgetown, spoke at UC Hastings Law School. Well, actually, he didn't speak, unfortunately. He was scheduled to participate in a discussion about the battle for retiring Justice Breyer's seat on the Supreme Court with a professor at Hastings, uh, Rory Little. But what ended up happening was Prof uh, Professor Shapiro was not able to utter a single word. What happened was he flew out across the country to go to Hastings in San Francisco and appeared before an angry group of students who were protesting his remarks on Twitter uh, concerning the selection of uh, President Biden for uh, the Supreme Court seat of Justice Breyer. And these students who were very offended by uh, some of Ilya Shapiro's tweets, which he admitted were inartfully worded, refused to let him get a word out. Whenever he would try to speak, they would shout, they would bang tables, they hurled profanities and ad hominem attacks, personal insults at him. And as a result, uh, the event was uh, unable to really even begin. Uh, at a certain point, um, Ilya gave up and the event concluded without having uh, any discussion of any sort. Uh, and this was an example of students being able to essentially uh, literally cancel an event at a uh, major U.S. law school. If you thought that was an isolated event, a uh, little more than a week later on March 10 of last year at my alma mater, Yale Law School, a very similar thing uh, happened. The Federalist Society chapter at Yale was hosting a debate, ironically enough, about free speech, featuring two students, uh, two uh, professors, uh, two speakers, excuse me, who are ideologically diverse. There was Monica Miller from the American Humanist Association, and there was Kristen Wagner from the Conservative Alliance Defending Freedom. And I should make clear that, again, these were very ideologically diverse speakers. The uh, ADF, for Alliance Defending Freedom, is a conservative Christian organization. The American Humanist Association, uh, on the other hand, is uh, you know fairly far to the left. Uh, Monica Miller was actually in the news last year because they were behind a case seeking uh, habeas rights for elephants. Uh, so again, uh, an ideologically diverse panel. And what happened here was, before the panel could really get underway, Approximately 100 student protesters crowded into the room and ad ad attempted to do what had been done at Hastings. They attempted to uh, shout and make so much noise that the panel was uh, uh, to basically prevent the panel from continuing. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was a moderator there, uh, Professor Kate Stiff, who uh, took control of the event, and she read Yale's free speech uh, policy to the protesters, and she warned them that uh, essentially they would have a three, three strikes and you're out uh, a policy. Uh, she would read the warning uh, three times, and if they didn't vacate the room by the third time, uh, they would be subject to discipline. Uh, so eventually, the protesters did leave, but I, what I would note is the protesters viewed this protest as their own expression of free speech, actually. When Professor Stith uh, told the students to please quiet down, uh, one of them actually yelled back, this is our free speech. So they believed that attempting to drown out or shout down these speakers was actually their own exercise of protected expression. Uh, eventually, the protesters left, and the event did continue. But uh, even though the event did officially continue to a close, unlike the one at Hastings, what ended up happening was the protest went, protesters went into the hallway. And while they were in the hallway, they stamped their feet, they continued to shout, they made huge amounts of noise, they sang happy birthday to somebody because it happened to be their birthday. And even though the event did take place, uh, I heard uh, firsthand from people who were in the event that it was extremely difficult to hear the speakers. 
And this event was not the only event that was disrupted. There was a faculty workshop at the time uh, featuring an international human rights uh, professor who, which had to be moved onto Zoom because nobody could hear. There were students taking self-administered ex administered exams on a different floor of the law school, and uh, they also uh, were disturbed in their test taking. And there were two classes uh, that had to essentially be canceled because the protesters were making so much noise. Uh, and as a result, uh, again, I think Yale did get a lot of bad publicity, and this was unfortunately the latest in a series of free speech problems at Yale, which I won't get into right now because we only have an hour and a half and there are other speakers, but uh, unfortunately there have been a series of controversies at Yale regarding civil discourse or the lack thereof. I did say though that I was going to close with a note of optimism. So in the wake of this, again, there was a lot of criticism of the Yale Law School administration and after a lot of negative press and complaints by alumni and donors and even students, uh, Dean Heather Gherkin did announce some new policies at Yale Law School. They did clarify the uh, free speech policy uh, to make clear that substantial disruptions of events would not be tolerated and would subject the students to discipline. They added to the 1L orientation a segment or section on civil discourse, teaching students how to disagree with each other disagreeably, which is obviously going to be a very important skill, not just for law students, but also for practicing lawyers. They introduced a ban on surreptitious recording, which is interesting. This kind of is something that defenders of free speech can argue about, but the theory behind the ban was they didn't want students feeling nervous about speaking freely in class or uttering a controversial viewpoint or playing devil's advocate and then fearing that some classmate was going to record them and then upload some out of context snippet of somebody saying something controversial to Twitter or TikTok or what have you. So now if you want to record something, you have to do so with the permission of essentially the folks who are present. Uh, and so it seems that perhaps these Changes are making a difference because just last month, Kristen Wagner of the ADF returned to Yale Law School. She was going to be talking about 303 Creative v. Alanis, which is one of the most important um, free expression cases before the court, the Supreme Court this term. And once again, it was a debate. Nadine Strawson, the former uh, head of the ACLU, was there, and the panel was moderated by former Yale Law Dean Robert Post, who is a First Amendment uh, expert in his own right. And this time, there actually was no protest. Uh, there was no protest at the event. The, there, the Outlaws group, which is a group of LGBTQ students at Yale, held a, a counter event uh, the day before the Yale Federalist Society event with Kristen Wagner. They had an event about the threats that certain right-wing groups are posing to LGBTQ uh, populations in the United States. That was on Monday. The Yale Federalist Society event was on Tuesday. Members of the Federalist Society attended the Outlaws event. Members of the Outlaws organization attended the Federalist Society event. There were uh, certainly pointed questions of Kristen Wagner and Nadine Strassen and Dean Post at the panel, but the questions were respectful. They were not insulting. Uh, they were not trying to shout over anybody. And the event uh, concluded uh, very, very smoothly. So what I take away from this, and I know that we're going to be hearing from the other panelists about this, is look, policies do make a difference. I think a lot of these issues are cultural, and we can talk about that too. And so culture is very important, but strong leadership makes a difference, and policies do make a difference. And I think Yale trying to uh, both strengthen and clarify its free speech policy, and also uh, adding a segment to orientation about civil discourse, I think perhaps uh, made a difference. It's still uh, early to tell. We're certainly not uh, near the end of the school year, and so we may see future uh, disruptions or protests at Yale or at other law schools. But I would say that so far this year has been, this academic year has been a fairly calm one compared to the one that I just described featuring the incidents at Hastings and at Yale. So I am cautiously optimistic. I think people are very concerned about the implications that the lack of civil discourse will have uh, for not just legal education, but also the practice of law. And we're going to be hearing about that as well. So I am optimistic, but cautiously so. And I think we still need to be very vigilant about the challenges to free speech, intellectual diversity, and civil discourse that are posed uh, both in our law schools and uh, in the legal profession. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Professor? Uh, Renee? Sorry. Yes. Thanks to the uh, the Federal Society and to Alita Cass for putting together this panel. 
this panel on uh, how law schools can promote uh, civility is much needed. And in fact, uh, many of my students would say it's high time uh, for such a panel. It's difficult for many of us to understand what conservative students are going through in law schools today, because the situation was so different from when we were in law school. Uh, and even many of my colleagues who are immersed in this environment are oblivious to what's going on. Some of them may be deliberately so. Uh, but I would say that the major threat to civility in law schools does not come from the faculty or administration. It comes from fellow students. And David has just described some of that. Students tell me routinely that there is a presumption that conservative views are dismissed and ridiculed among their peers. Conservative students are isolated. A student told me that once it became known that he was friends with a group of conservative students, other students shunned him. A different student told me, most other students stare at us like we're a zoo exhibit. Uh, not surprisingly, there's not a lot of desire for interaction. And of course, uh, conservative students routinely self-center, so, so excuse me, self-censor uh, inside and outside the classroom uh, in institutions that supposedly are dedicated to free inquiry. Now, most of this censorship is informal peer pressure, but occasionally students try to censor other students and even faculty in a formal way. So last year, the uh, Student Bar Association at GW passed a resolution uh, condemning the use of the word alien. Students and faculty members were not supposed to use this word, even though, of course, it's all over the statutes and court opinions. Uh, most students at GW, and I suspect most students at other law schools, are not activists who uh, aggressively promote such things. So their main goals are to learn some law and get a job. But they still go along with the censorship and participate in the shunning. And I think social media uh, definitely contributes to that. Uh, which uh, leads to a question, where did this come from? Where did this atmosphere that's so different now than it was when we were in law school, what's the origin of that? And it appears that the major turning point was 2014. And in that year, a group of students turned 18 and therefore entered college campuses who for the first time had childhoods and adolescences dominated by social media. And that's the account given by uh, Gary Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, that book is well worth reading uh, if anyone has not yet. And of course, uh, the decline in religious faith has made politics existential. <clears throat> so what to do about this? Uh, as David suggested, strong leadership in the administration can make a difference. So I'll give you another example. Uh, in June 2022, following the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade, students and others uh, at GW signed a petition uh, stating that Justice Thomas should not be allowed to continue as an adjunct faculty member. Uh, this agitation, I should point out, was mainly coming from undergraduates. Promptly after that, uh, the provost of the university, Chris Bracey, and the dean of the law school, Dana Matthew, issued a strong statement explaining why Justice Thomas would not be fired. Uh, and among other things, I can quote uh, a little bit from it. Uh, it states, we steadfastly support the robust exchange of ideas and deliberation. And it says that debate is an essential part of our university's academic and educational mission to train future leaders who are prepared to address the world's most urgent problems. <clears throat> so a strong statement like that uh, can very much help. And you can contrast that statement with some of the statements and actions by other deans uh, that David has uh, told us about. Now, unfortunately, Justice Thomas chose not to continue as an adjunct professor at GW, apparently, uh, at least in part, for safety reasons. 
Uh, so I think it's fair to say that the, uh, this petition had an effect despite strong leadership from the top. A similar problem occurred when the uh, Federal Society and the Christian Legal Society teamed up to put on an extensive program on religious liberty. Other law students considered disrupting the program because some speakers were affiliated with an organization that had argued against same-sex marriage. The administration provided an alternative venue uh, for these students who were thinking about disrupting uh, that program so that they could hold their own program. And the dean and the associate dean uh, both attended the program on religious liberty. So that program was not disrupted. However, that said, uh, fellow students did succeed in suppressing turnout at that event. So leadership from the top can help, but there are still many obstacles to civility. It's definitely not a cure-all. Uh, for one thing, dean of students' offices are not well attuned to the problems that conservatives face, and they can, on occasion, ignore or downplay them. Um, so uh, given all this, what can be done? Uh, one thing I would say is to add some courses so that students can become familiar with conservative thought. And uh, one example of that is a course that uh, Alita Cass and Judge Gregory Katzis of the DC Circuit are co-teaching at GW called Conservative Legal Thought. So this can be done in part with adjuncts. It can also, of course, be done with those few uh, regular faculty uh, who, uh, who are capable and willing of te to teach such a course. Um, in addition, I would say, uh, this uh, issue of civility can be addressed with some uh, training or attention brought uh, to law students. Uh, and it's important to emphasize in this context that diversity, which law schools constantly talk about as so many or other organizations, includes uh, not just the usual uh, types of diversity that people think of, but also diversity of viewpoint. And I think that's important to emphasize uh, again and again with your colleagues and uh, the administrations of law schools. That can be done uh, during orientation. Uh, during orientation, the first years come in and they're given all sorts of pointers on how to, uh, how to address diversity and diversity of viewpoint can be one of those. That training can continue uh, with training on professionalism, especially uh, during the first year. Uh, so that may help somewhat. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, optimistic as, uh, as David is, uh, that major disruptions uh, of programs uh, will be headed off, but I'm still concerned about uh, the relation of law students to each other. Thank you, uh, Eugene, you're up next. Uh, yeah, so I'm very glad that, that people are putting on these kinds of panels, particularly Federal Society, although glad that others are paying attention as well. Um, uh, you know, there a, was an old Soviet era joke uh, that was told, it turns out about Poles, every, uh, uh, there are stereotypes of every nation and every other nation. In Russia, there was never this sense that Poles were supposed to be dumb. In fact, Poles were sort of seen as an intellectual nation. Uh, but the stereotype was that they were morose, which to be fair, if you study history, they had much to be morose about. So the joke is that a Russian asks a Pole, how, how are things going? And the Pole says, uh, says better, better, uh, uh, better than tomorrow, of course, worse than yesterday. So, you know, most of my career, I have tried to be optimistic. I guess I still try to be optimistic. Um, it's uh, uh, the problem is I think that uh, uh, things in law school have been getting worse. I'm hoping that that trend has stopped, but I'm not sure. And I think they've been getting worse in part because people have taken the ball, take, excuse me, taken their eye off the ball of what it is that law schools should be teaching. And what law schools should be teaching is how people can be effective lawyers. Now, what are the marks of an effective lawyer? What does an effective lawyer need to do? One thing the, the effective lawyer needs to do is to understand the other side's best arguments. 
Now, actually, in a sense, you might say all of us should, academics ought to move. Maybe that's sort of the right thing for an intellectual to do. You know, you could argue about that. But the bottom line is, as a lawyer, there's no question that in order to be an effective advocate for your clients and for your cause, you need to be able to do that. Because otherwise, how can you anticipate those arguments and how can you essentially rebut those arguments? The consequence of that is you have to hear those arguments. And even if you find those arguments morally repugnant, you know, it's your job. It's kind of like, as a psychotherapist, you might need to hear all sorts of very unpleasant thoughts that your clients have, maybe unpleasant experience having to do with sexual assault, having to do with violent fantasies, all sorts of things. But if you don't want to do that, then you shouldn't be a psychotherapist uh, because this is part of your job in order to, in order to be effective. Um, so one thing that I think people ought to see when they shout down people who they think have the wrong views, they may say, well, well wait a minute. Obviously, there are lots of people who have, for example, the ADF's view on gay rights questions. Uh, the ADF, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, which is so, so the group, one of whose speakers was, was shouted down, and at least one of it, I think maybe even more than one, um, uh, are extremely effective lawyers that managed to win a lot of cases. Maybe they shouldn't have won them, but if you want to become an effective lawyer, generally, you should listen to, to effective lawyers. If you want to become an effective lawyer rebutting their arguments, you should figure out what it is that makes them so successful. A second thing relatedly is just understanding how people with very different views see the world. And here it's not because just you wanna anticipate the way the other side works. You wanna anticipate how the decision maker thinks, right? You're a lawyer, you're gonna be dealing with a, uh, uh, with a jury, let's say. There are 12 people. Criminal case, you gotta persuade every single one of them. You might persuade 10 of them because they're all right thinking and the two are benighted deplorables, but that's not enough, whether you're a defense lawyer or a prosecutor. Or a prosecutor. You gotta persuade 12. Uh, and uh, uh, in other situations, it's enough if you persuade a majority, but maybe the majority is not on your side. You've got to be able to understand how the other side thinks. And if you have developed a habit of sort of thinking, this person has these views, they're bad person. The first thing I should think is they're bad. That's just not conducive to figuring out how can I persuade them to be to, um, uh, to uh, effectively persuade someone. You have to ask, you know, why is it that they think what they think, and how can I reach them in the place where they live and how they think through things and bring them around to my way of thinking. Um, uh, you need to also, as a lawyer, be willing to make arguments that you disagree with. Sometimes that's just going to be your job, not to be sure. Some people say, well, I will never make an argument I disagree with. Okay, maybe if you're, if you're a solo practitioner, you might be in that kind of position where you can pick and choose. If you've got, especially if you've got an independent income, that's nice too. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you go to work at a firm, you might find yourself being assigned to a case where you don't agree with some argument. Or alternatively, you could even, somebody could say, look, you know, can you help me out? Please be on a moot court. Play the role of some judge who disagrees with me. You gotta be, you gotta be in a position uh, to do that. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, two other things I wanted to mention. Uh, 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 one is you also need to be able to learn from people who you disagree with. So I'm talking about persuading people you disagree with and anticipating the arguments of people you disagree with, but you should also be able to learn from them. You, after all, you're not going to become, all right, out of law school, an appellate judge. You're not going to become a partner at a law firm. You're not going to become the attorney general of the U.S. attorney. You're going to become a lower level employee where you'd be working for someone. And some of the time you'll be working for people you entirely agree with. Some of the time you'll be working for someone you disagree with. And you know, the hope is, while keeping your own views, you're certainly entitled to if you if you believe in them, if you continue to believe in them, you should adhere to your own views, but you should be open to the possibility that here's this partner you're working for, not somebody who sees things the world uh, the way that you do, but the question is, how can you get the most out of your experience working with him? And again, if your reaction is, well, he's a bad person, and I should do what I can to distance myself from this bad person, you will lose a learning opportunity. And finally, the last thing that you need to do, or 
uh, just the last on this list, there are many other things you need to do, is uh, to learn how to unflappably confront unpleasant facts and arguments. That there are going to be all sorts of unpleasant facts out there. I mean, law is often involves dealing with very bad acts of various sorts, some of them very serious crimes, some of them could be even in civil cases, serious frauds and uh, other kinds of behavior. Some of it is the basis of the case, some of it is just sort of tangential facts. And you need to acquire the habit of saying, you know, I'm going to do what I can to let it roll off my back. Uh, now, not everything can. There are some things you see hard to unsee. You hear hard to unhear. It's going to stick with you. That's an unfortunate reality of life. But you can, I think, adjust that a little bit. You can train yourself to do more of that and do less of that. And one of the things that I've been seeing in law schools is I think people have, have uh, conveyed the message to many students that there is that they are better people for being more upset by upsetting things as opposed to what i think we used to teach people more which is you're a better person for trying to be as unupset as that as possible especially when you've got a job to do um so all of those things it seems to me uh, are things that i would have thought it's pretty clear that law schools ought to be teaching i think for i think a lot of people even today assume they ought to be teaching that and yet much of what we do is uh, inconsistent with that, or much of what institutions do is inconsistent with that. They encourage people to try to build uh, intellectual and emotional divides that separate them from other people, make it harder for them to understand where the other people are coming from, make it harder for them to listen to those people. And then on top of that, of course, also encourage or tolerate them shout it, shouting down those people. And that's very bad. But even if they, nobody shouts down someone, just refuses to show up to listen to somebody because they think they have some benighted uh, viewpoint, that's bad for education too. It's not as bad as shouting down, but it's bad as well. And I think that's not how law school should be teaching uh, students. So that's the short version. I, you know, I don't think anything what I said is, is particularly novel. It's all kind of obvious, but it's the kind of obvious that I think might be worth law school sort of thinking more seriously about. Let me close with one suggestion, which I've tried to pitch to various places and nobody's been catching it so far. I think one thing that schools can do is affirmatively put on events, uh, debates or just panels, like a conversation of people who disagree on important topics. And they should ask themselves, what are the topics that are in the news, that are in the courts, that are obviously the subject of debate? You don't have to talk about everything that's 95-5, a split, country is split, but if it's split 50-50 or 60-40, if it's not being talked about at the law school, we need to put on an event about that. We need to put on an event about transgender athletes in sport, in, in, in uh, women's sports. We need to put on an event about affirmative action. We need to put on an event abortion. Why? Because we're not seeing those events. These are obviously important subjects. For whatever reason, they're not being, the discussions of them are not being organized. That's the law school's job, the administration's job, with whatever, with whatever imprimatur, uh, value its imprimatur might have, uh, that that they ought to be uh, ought to be putting those on. I think schools should do more of that. Right now, I think skills are schools are trying hard to do less of that. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, I think Jay, you're up next. Well, first, thank you to uh, FedSoc for having me. This. Uh... This is a first for me, and I'm really excited to be here. I was kind of wondering what my role was going to be, and, um, and I feel good about it now. I, I think that, uh, so I'm a plaintiff's attorney, um, and uh, I'm not conservative, um, and I found myself nodding my head with with um, really all the comments before. So, But I, I think I can approach this in a slightly different way, which is I want to make the liberal argument for a robust discussion in law school, which is crazy. It is crazy that I have to say that. Uh, I, I went to Brandeis, I was a philosophy major. Um, at Brandeis, we had a huge tradition of bringing um, speakers from all different political um, ideologies uh, who spoke to students on really uncomfortable issues. When, when Brandeis is a predominantly Jewish school, uh, we dealt with a lot of issues having to do with, uh, with the Mideast, um, and um, Palestinian uh, relations with, with Jews, and uh, it was liberals and conservatives. And my view was I was blown away that we had international leaders coming and speaking to us and taking our questions and answering them in thoughtful ways. 
that was that's how I went into law school. Um, the the students that I was most interested in hearing from and the professors that I cared most about were the ones who vehemently disagreed with me. I the ones who agreed with me, I got it. We you know we, we could talk separately. We had the same views. I didn't feel I could learn as much from them. It's, it's actually funny. I was my Jason uh, Kilborn was in my section um, first year of law school. Uh, he was one of the more active speakers, uh, and there were huge debates, uh, a, a lot of the same debates involving affirmative action, um, involving which was you know incredibly uncomfortable for a lot of people. You know, I, I think the one of the key points I'd make is that if you're going to have honest discussions, you have to risk making people uncomfortable. And I, I hate the term civility because it's such a it's it's, it's almost a meaningless term. Everyone agrees with with civility in and I think the common sense term of the word, which is that you should be polite to people. You shouldn't go out of your way uh, uh, to to make them personally uncomfortable. Uh, you shouldn't engage in ad hominem attacks. But but I do I I think you're actually doing a disservice to law students by trying to make them not uncomfortable around legal issues. So I I'm. Uh, I, I have the luxury of, of being a, a guest lecturer and an adjunct professor at various law schools. And I've seen the shift over the last number of years where um, I was told the last time I spoke at a school, don't put students on the spot. That's one of the key things. And that was that was a difficult message to hear because I'm, I'm not someone who, who wants to put people on the spot, again, personally, but I do intellectually. That that is that is how you learn. That that's what it means to be a lawyer. That's how you grow. Uh, and the answer was you can't do it. It's a it's a new way way of of teaching now, which is you know kind of comfort first. That made me really nervous um, as a practitioner um, to push back on on Eugene for a second. It's not it's not just solos who who can bring their own cases. Um, my firm, we, we've got a number of attorneys at our firm, and we get to pick and choose our cases. Uh, so we don't have cases um, where where we disagree uh, with um, with our clients. You know, philosophically, you can always have disagreements. Um, but we have cases where uh, they tend to be high impact cases that involve issues that matter a lot to a lot of people. And this is going to surprise everyone. We have people, judges and juries and opposing counsel who have different views than us. So when I think about training lawyers, that 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 is, you know, what what I'm in it for. I want law schools to to produce the best lawyers for me possible. And then when they get to the firm, I want to train them as quickly as possible. What I want out of them, first and foremost, is a willingness to engage in difficult conversations. So as a plaintiff's attorney, we often have judges who are hostile to us. We have very difficult conversations. We ask for fees at the end of the day. We say, judge, we think we did a good job. We would like $45 million in fees. And we get a response from that. And sometimes the response is, are you kidding me? How on earth are you supposed to get that? I, I love that. I think that that the way to be a good lawyer is to love those types of questions because if somebody is asking you that type of question, it means they're engaged and you have a chance to convince them. The worst thing for for my career would be if judges said, "I don't want to make Mr. Edelson uncomfortable by questioning why he thinks that his firm's entitled to that amount in fees." So instead, I won't really ask any questions and then I'll just cut his fee. That's not helpful to me. I don't want that on a motion to dismiss either. I don't want. I don't want that when I'm talking to opposing counsel. I think that that we really, really need to 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 convince everybody that that one of the huge values of a legal education is the dialogue. Um, and this is also going to stun people. I was a very confident. Uh, kid going to law school, and I didn't know a lot. I was wrong about, about, on a lot of issues. 
Um, so when I took those classes with professors who I disagreed with, a lot of times they convinced me I was wrong. That was wonderful. That's got to be part of the purpose of law school. It's not just trying to get you to be a better lawyer, but also it should be a debate about ideas where you can grow. Um, I want to I want to end with um, with something with, which which I think is is encouraging, which is in my experience, there's an incredible amount of noise around the, this issue. And sometimes it can it can be set up as though we're defining a generation. And so, you know, I, I don't think that this is this is necessarily a generation of, of people who are have been coddled and want to be coddled. I think there's a segment of that, but I also see every day that young people come to our firm. I see them in law school, I interact with them um, elsewhere. And they want to roll up their sleeves. They want to do hard work. They they want to get better, and they want to fight for their clients. Um, so so I want to leave with that note. Thank you, Jay. Paul. Thank you, Judge. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's it's great to follow on Jay. I mean, you know, Jay spends most of his time as a plaintiff's lawyer. I spend most of my time uh, as a defense lawyer. Um, so I couldn't do what I do without Jay. So I'm very happy to, to be here with him. I, I want to start by just echoing a couple of points that he made, though, um, from my own perspective. I mean, one is um, because I've had the pleasure to practice at smaller firms from time to time, I actually have, unlike somebody who would be at just a big law firm, I've actually had the chance to do some plaintiff side work over the course of my career. And I will tell you, it's made me a much better lawyer when I'm on the defense side, because I can understand the perspective of the lawyers on the other side. I can even understand to a degree the economics of kind of what makes them tick and what would make them settle and not settle a case. And I, I do think that there's just a broader point there, which is, you know, if you get in sort of a silo where you only hear views that you agree with and you don't confront unpleasant contrary views, you're just not going to be as good a lawyer in the long run. The second thing I just echo that Jay said, but it, I'll just give you my own sort of appellate lawyer spin on it. Um, the single worst thing that can happen to you as an appellate lawyer is to get a dead silent panel. Because you know that at least one of those judges is thinking that the arguments in your brief are wrong. But if they stay silent, they're not telling you why they think you're wrong. They're not, they're not giving you an opportunity to convince them that there might be you know, something else that you have to offer to pers persuade them your way. So as an appellate lawyer, kind of your stock in trade is hostile questions or questions that at least are skeptical. And you know, as, as a corollary to that, you know, I've often been asked, is it hard for you to represent clients in cases where you know, you, you think their legal position is wrong. And my response is, it's actually easier to represent clients on a legal issue where you're skeptical about their position, because the job of a lawyer is to figure out what are the skeptical questions that judges are going to ask, and then figure out the best answers to those questions. And if you yourself start out skeptical, um, you're halfway home. So, so I really think this idea of not just sort of getting into the mindset that there's only one right side to legal issues. Anyone who espouses the other view or represents the other side is somewhere between wrong and evil. I think that's really a very unhelpful uh, aspect of what's happening in the law schools. So, so let me say just a couple of things about the problem and a couple of things about where there might be a basis for a solution. On, on the problem, I mean, I was really struck by what Renee said about the view of maybe the, not necessarily the actual majority, but kind of the vocal majority or the practical majority, that the conservative students are, you know, really to be shunned, their views are to be dismissed. I mean, that, you know, that is problematic enough and on the law schools. And one of the things that I've seen happen compared to my time in law school, is I think that 
atmosphere really breeds tribalism. I mean, the conservative students, given that's at least what they perceive to be the majority view, they almost have no choice but to sort of band together and kind of hunker down. And then in a weird way, I think that the sort of, you know, the, the Federalist Society, the perception that um, that's both a home for the conservative students, but it also puts them in the pole position for judicial clerkships with conservative judges of whom there are a lot. I, I think that all just kind of like, it's like a feedback loop that breeds kind of more and more sort of, you know, hostility, tribalism, and it's just is kind of a vicious cycle, um, which is problematic. But here's another thing that makes it really problematic in my view in the long run, is that right now, for better or for worse, a working majority of the Supreme Court has a relatively conservative outlook on the law. And so if the majority of law students are processing the view that is espoused in the average case by a majority of the court as you know, not just wrong and not just debatably wrong, but really problematic, almost deplorable, then I really worry about how we're gonna promote sort of judicial legitimacy in the long run. Because I think you know, the judiciary over the long run, it's very hard for judges to defend themselves. So to a certain extent, they rely on the bar to explain to the general public what it is that judges do, why when a judge rules in an unpopular way, say Justice Scalia votes to uh, say, you know, green light flag burning, it's sort of up to the lawyers to explain how that happens, what makes kind of the law tick. And if the majority of lawyers are being trained in a way that they think that a majority of the Supreme Court is really not legitimate in the way they approach legal issues, we're going to have a real problem over the long run. So one last thing just to mention about the problems before I get to at least the kernels of the solution. Um, you know, this would all be bad enough if it just sort of was limited to the law schools. And then when you got to law firms, you know, things changed, people rolled up their sleeves and went to work the way that sort of Jay was alluding to. But, you know, this, the, the mentalities have sort of crept over into the law, in the law firm cultures. There are definitely certain clients, certain views that really aren't acceptable to, um, the, at least sort of the younger associates that are coming right out of law school. And, you know, they've just spent three years sort of suppressing to a degree people's views who disagree with them. And they bring a lot of those same mentalities and tactics into the sort of law firm. So there's subtle pressure, say, at the law firm not to represent clients that make fossil fuels or whatever the cause of the day is. And there's certainly a role for those students to express their views. But I do think that as some of this gets sort of transland, translated into the law firm culture, there's some real problems for the profession in the long run. So here's my kind of two sort of sources of at least potential hope. And I'm not, this isn't contradistinction. I mean, Renee's absolutely right. Leadership can play a huge role. David is absolutely right. Policies can play an important role. But I kind of feel like there's, there's two things that if we can get some recommitment to, it can move the needle in the right way. Uh, the first is just the First Amendment. And if I think back to my time in law school, I think the biggest difference between now and then is that back in the day, you'd still have conservative students getting hissed a little bit, at least at Harvard Law School, but there was a shared commitment to the First Amendment. And if anything, I think the typical sort of left-leaning law student was probably more committed to letting the Nazis march through Skokie than the average conservative law student. And that's now sort of flipped around in a way that the First Amendment itself has become another partisan issue where you know, the, the, the sort of conservative view or what's seemingly the conservative view, but it's really like the Justice Brennan view, um, or the justice black view gets discredited. And I kind of feel like if we can't reaffirm the commitment to the first amendment, which to me just seems like so obvious to kind of lawyers, if we can't, if we can't get that right, then we really are in, uh, I think, you know, very dangerous waters. 
But I do think that's a winnable debate and it's a great place to start um, and try to reaffirm people's commitments to it. The second thing is to really kind of spend a little bit more time trying to instill something that sounds like an old fashioned word, but I think is really important. And it's the idea of professionalism. I mean, we as lawyers want to be treated not just as random business people, we wanna be treated as professionals. We get certain rights or privileges because we are a professional. The reason we don't have to disclose our attorney-client communications is because it's a profession. Like businesses, normal businesses don't get to withhold sort of secrets um, if there's a legitimate legal basis to get them in discovery. Lawyers get to do that because we're a profession. But being a profession sort of means something. And, and if you think about other professions like doctors or, you know, I like, I, I like Eugene's, you know, analogy of the psychotherapist who's got to hear all these awful things. Like part of what it means to be a professional is that you have unique skills that you can offer people. And to a degree, that means you have to sort of hear what, what their problem is before you can try to solve it. If you think about representing a criminal defendant, they may, unless they're completely innocent, um, and I've certainly had some criminal defendant clients who believe that they are completely innocent, but unless your client is completely innocent, they're gonna tell you some unpleasant things. And you're not supposed to shun them because they've done unpleasant things. You're supposed to help them. And another important component of professionalism, and I'll end on this note, but if in the other professions, you don't allow your clients who you are providing professional help to, to essentially cause you to drop your other clients or your other patients. Like the idea that a doctor would be pressured by some of his or her patients to drop some other group of patients because they're really not very nice people, or the idea that the psychoanalyst would you know, be pressured by one of his or her patients in the couch because they don't like some of the other people that are sitting on the couch. It just, it, that's not, I think, a norm that a profession can allow. And so I really think that that's something that the law school has got to do a better job about. You know, I always felt like in law school, professional responsibility was like the last class anybody really wanted to take. And if it weren't for the multi-state ethics exam, nobody would really take it. And I kind of feel like, you know, the law schools ought to think really hard about how do they make students like want to take a professional responsibility class? How do they make it interesting and relevant and speak to them in a way that makes it, you know, like the people would actually take it as an elective. So I think that those are, those are two things kind of re doubling down on commitment to the first amendment and professionalism, I think could be some part of the path forward. Thank you. Uh, we've got quite a few questions and uh, I know we want to have a good discussion here. So I'm going to actually start by taking the prerogative to ask uh, one basic question for the professors and then one question for the lawyers. Um, Jay, you had talked about, uh, if I heard you correctly, some of your favorite professors in law school were those you disagreed with. Uh, that really resonates with me. Some of my favorite professors, I recall uh, David Strauss uh, is just one of many examples, you know, not somebody I necessarily agree with on everything. But we just, I really enjoyed my relationship with him uh, during law school, same with, with colleagues today. Um, for the professors, are you seeing friendships across the aisle? Uh, are they still happening in terms of uh, the law students? Uh, has that changed over time? Or are you seeing fewer friendships uh, across these battle lines? Um, so you mean between the law students? You're not talking about students, yeah. Uh, relationships between uh, as, well as, oh, I, as well as students and professors as well. But I'm, I'm, we're, it seems to me that we're focused a lot on the students uh, to the extent that that's sort of the, the one, at least one big source, if not the biggest source. Uh, so let's talk about students vis-a-vis vis other students and also students vis-a-vis -vis, uh, professors. Well, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, unfortunately, uh, those kinds of uh, relationships between students uh, conservatives and non-conservatives are becoming increasingly rare because conservatives are so shunned. Uh, and uh, the more I'm thinking about it and the more I'm hearing this panel, 
I'm starting to think that there's a really fundamental disconnect uh, between some of the law, the things that law schools are preaching and uh, some of the things that students need uh, to go out and be good lawyers, as I've been described by members of this panel. And that is, uh, so several members of this panel have pointed out that law students need to learn to be uncomfortable. They need to learn to hear views that are different from theirs and uh, how to discuss them. Uh, the difficulty is that the whole DEI regime, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, is based on an idea of trying to make everybody as comfortable as possible. Um, and uh, that is, is a fundamental conflict uh, and is going to be a, a difficult. DEI is, is all, about, uh, all about comfort, all about vindicating as many different views as possible and, um, and not really uh, about debating or discussing them. Uh, and so that is a, a fundamental problem and a difficulty that law schools are going to have when it comes to training and civility. Can I, can I just add something to that? Wait. Uh, which, which is, you know, the, the idea that, that the goal is to make everybody comfortable is fine. But what I found is often, if, you're, if you are trying to make people comfortable, you're also making a large group of people uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's a movement to kind of share people's personal stories in law school, for example. That was something which in law school would have made me very uncomfortable. Um, so I, I kind of disagree with the premise. And Renee, I know you're not endorsing the premise, but I think we've got to be careful about that, which is the, the, the focus on comfort seems to extend to a certain group of people as opposed to everybody. Well, Jay, while you have the floor, I'll go ahead and ask the, 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 my lawyer question for both you and uh, Paul. Uh, to the extent that we're seeing these dynamics play out in law school, uh, are you all seeing it uh, bleed over to law firm life? Uh, as obviously you guys are hiring associates fresh from the law schools every year, are you seeing changes uh, that uh, uh, affect what you guys have to do? Or is it largely just a, a campus phenomenon? Should, should I go first? Please. Um, yeah, we we have seen uh, a, a shift. Um, the you know we've had uh, kind of these minor dusts up dusts up um, over issues that um, perhaps I'm just getting old, but but have confused me. Um, you know, one which we at the firm called Blazer Gate uh, was a situation where we had a mediation and. Um, uh, I was leading the mediation and we're a teaching firm. So I had a number of summer associates and younger people at the mediation. And uh, what, what I did was I told people what I was gonna wear, um, which was something similar to this. And I did that because I'm a first generation lawyer and uh, always appreciated someone saying, this is what to do because I had no idea when I joined a big firm and stepped in many times except someone would grab me and say no you actually don't wear your jacket to this meeting okay great um and also we've had problems in the past we had a guy who showed up to a mediation in cargo pants cargo shorts and we had to send him back and we're like you can't do that we're we're informal but we're professional all right so back to blazer gate we we had told people we're wearing blazers and then last minute um one of the younger attorneys said to the summer associates, actually, Jay may not wear a blazer. I don't even know why that was relevant, but it was. That ended up, we lost four days at the firm over it because apparently this, this associate, who was a woman, was telling other women what to wear. Um, and um, for me, that, that was an interesting experience because what I wanted everyone to focus on was that we were involved in a huge mediation. They'd never been to a mediation before. A lot was going on. Um, and I wanted to teach them what I knew, and I wanted to hear from them, you know, what their thoughts were. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was about something which, which I found to be, you know, really not pressing or, or relevant. Um, and, you know, that, that's part of the new normal. And we had to make a decision at the firm, which is, you know, how do we deal with that? Um, do we... Do we say, 
you know, okay, we're we're going to lose a couple of days of the firm and, and we're going to make sure everyone is comfortable. Um, or do we kind of push our own priorities, which is focus on the work. If they're big issues, bring it up efficiently and we'll deal with it. We, we chose a ladder. Um, and I think, you know, that that's a choice that, that saved the firm. Um, but uh, but yeah, that we're seeing more and more of that, unfortunately. And we're a liberal firm. Like, why is that happening to us? That's so I think is. one one thing that you are bringing up here uh, reminds me of a conversation I just recently had. Somebody was talking about some elite university who they were saying one of the things that we really are looking for in undergrads is people who are real activists for what they believe in. And he said, you know, not so long ago we were saying that one thing you should be doing in undergrad is questioning what you believe in. And, you know, probably we were more correct. We were more correct back then. Now, to be sure, you should have the courage and the willingness to, to invest in things you eventually come to believe in. But at the same time, you need to appreciate you have a lot to learn. All of us have a lot to learn, even when we're at our advanced ages. Uh, but especially when you're a student, especially when you're when you are a junior associate. And so some things you might just sort of say, you know, I, I'm entering a new field here. I don't really know what the dress codes are. And even if I feel really confident that some dress codes are unjust or unfair or whatever else, well, maybe I should at least figure out what they are and then later on make my own decisions once I sort of think a little bit about, uh, about this. Um, uh, likewise, uh, in, in, uh, as to substantive things, as to rhetorical questions, as to how to articulate arguments, as to, as to how to think through difficult and sort of morally fraught questions, I think it would be nice if we encouraged our students to say, look, uh, we appreciate you have beliefs, uh, but you, one thing that we're hoping you'll do is you'll sort of absorb a bunch of different kinds of perspectives, not as your own, but as being out there. And then maybe after some time, you'll get a better sense. You'll say, well, I don't want to work at a firm that has what I believe is sort of an oppressive attitude towards a dresser or whatever else. Okay, fine. But learn a little bit about the way they do these things first before you make up your mind. And I think we're encouraging students to make up their mind very quickly. Uh, Judge Ho, may I ask a question of the my fellow panelists here? Please. Is that all right? Please. Absolutely. My question, my question is this. Um, it has a little bit to do with the, the tribalism that uh, Paul was talking about and, and several others. And it is the phenomenon of students who uh, will put the Federal Society on their resumes when they're applying for judicial clerkships. Uh, because that is, is viewed as an advantage, but then they will take it off their resumes when they are applying to law firm jobs. And many students seem to feel it is a kiss of death to have federal society on your resume when you are applying to, uh, to large firms in particular. And my students get very frustrated with this. Uh, and uh, one thing they want to know is why aren't uh, conservative partners or, or other sorts of partners uh, at law firms, why aren't they pushing back more on this kind of perceived discrimination against conservative students? So, I mean, I'll take a crack at that. And, you know, I, I mean, I'll give my, you know, if there are any students in the audience, um, you know, I'll give my own advice, you know, and I, and I may not be the right person to take advice from on this whole subject since I, I don't seem to last long at big law firms. But I, I would say, you you know, if if you're applying to a firm that you think you have to, you know, if you're if you're legitimately a member of the Federal Society, if you were just faking it to get a clerkship, well, then shame on you. But but if you're legitimately a member of the Federalist Society and you think you need to take the Federalist Society off of your resume, to get an offer to work at a law firm, why in the world do you want to work there? I mean, please don't 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 succumb to that. You'll be you'll end up miserable. Um, now, I actually think that most law firms won't hold it against you, um, but but if one of them does, like shame on them. But why would you ever want to work there? Because, like I said, you just you're going to be miserable in the long run. So keep it on there. Um, the second thing I would say is. I mean, to the extent there are firms that would hold that against somebody, 
I think it's only a reflection of the kind of where the numbers of kind of lawyers are and where the skew is at some big law firms. And so, you know, if, if, if 80% of the people that you're likely to randomly interview with um, went to law school, at least at a time where they thought the Federalist Society was vaguely evil and should be shunned, well, then maybe, you know, may, maybe that's going to sort of play out in the recruiting process. And the, the lawyers at the firm that are more conservative or Federalist Society members themselves, there's not that much they're going to be able to do about it. Because um, to the extent people are taking that into account, they're probably not doing it open, openly and notoriously. Um, so, but again, I, I, I think that one's an easy one, easy for me to say, but like, don't work at some place. And I mean, you know, I, I would, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I'd be, I'd be, I'd be flabbergasted if Jay's firm would take, hold that against anybody because like, you know, they just want good people and they're trying to get people who, you know, and in the same way, I'd be happy to hire somebody at my law firm if they put the ACS on their, on their resume. Um, again, in part, because like, you know, I already have a pretty good sense of how conservatives think, um, being one. Um, so I actually, you know, want to have some young lawyers in my moot courts who think about the law differently and ask sort of the hard questions that I might get from, you know, a randomly selected panel um, that has, you know, two or three more, you know, liberal leaning judges. And that's why even going back to my time in the SG's office, I, I always wanted to hire kind of in a very diverse way. Because I think that, you know, I, I felt like, wow, you know, I already have a pretty good sense of how Justice Scalia asked questions because I clerked for him. What I need are some people who clerk for Justice Breyer or who clerked for Justice Stevens, because maybe I don't instinctively sort of process the questions the same way that their boss would. So that's a good thing. And I mean, just to go full circle. So if, if you're applying to a law firm where you think they're not going to think that way and they're going to hold it against you, then you're applying to the wrong law firm. So I'm going to jump in here just briefly because, you know, I sort of hear what both Renee and Paul are saying. Uh, Paul, I tend to agree with you that, you know, why would you want to work at such a place? But Renee, uh, I definitely understand the students' plights because, you know, when I talk to uh, law students, when I go to these uh, events to speak or talking to clerks and hearing stories from their friends, the number of, it seems that the number of firms willing to behave the way Paul is describing is becoming increasingly perhaps even vanishingly small. I'm hearing stories about if you, you know, to the point of, you know, if you clerk for certain judges, firms will berate you and belittle you and won't hire you. I hear stories of not just, you know, you're not allowed to speak out during law school, law, law firm events, but I've heard of stories of law firms actually looking at what you've written uh, or said in private uh, as a basis for excluding you from, from law firm activities. And so, uh, again, Paul, I agree with you that people should stand up for themselves, but I also kind of worry, Renee, what you're saying about, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the current generation of leadership isn't really doing enough to protect the next generation of lawyers. Uh, I'm sorry for the comment, but I think David, something in there may have inspired David to respond, so I'm going to let David respond. Yeah, so I do have a couple of things. Uh, in terms of recommended reading on these subjects, I actually just last week had a piece in the Boston Globe. Uh, the title was not mine, but it's titled Big Laws Cancel Culture. And it talks about some of the incidents we've seen at law firms. And so if the question is, has this mentality migrated from law schools to law firms? I would say definitely yes. And I think that piece, including some of the stories discussed therein, including what happened with Paul at Kirkland and Ellis, I think some of those stories shed light on why maybe conservative lawyers or partners are not speaking up, because unfortunately, it may just be that if they speak up, you know, they're going to, it's going to be their head on the chopping block too. Uh, so I, I do think that's one point. And then I'll play devil's advocate on two things. One on this issue of resumes. You may be a centrist or conservative, but maybe it's not that huge a thing to you. You're not bringing your whole self to work. Like you just want to go to a good firm that has a good practice in a certain area, but for better or worse, that firm is very liberal, but maybe it doesn't mean that much to you. I could see leaving FedSoc off your resume because maybe you're like, look, I have these conservative views. They don't affect my ability to function in the workplace. This firm has the best structured finance practice in the country. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to maybe go in-house after a few years, but I'm just going to kind of, you know, hold my nose and, and, and get over it. But I want to play devil's advocate on a bigger issue because, you know, I, 
I don't want this to be entirely, uh, you know, sort of preaching to the choir. I think what some of the folks on the other side would say, just to kind of introduce their perspective, because when I give these talks at law schools or law firms, people say, well, you've told us all about free speech and ideological diversity and why that's all great. Well, what's the other side? So in the spirit of understanding the other side, let me just kind of briefly articulate their viewpoint. I think one, what they would say is, look, the legal profession is increasingly diverse. We have record numbers of women, people of color, LGBTQ individuals, first generation lawyers. And we're going to have some tensions as you know, the, the old guard adjusts to this increasing diversity. But the other thing is if we're going to let these new groups into the profession, we have to support them. It's not just enough to say, okay, great, you have a job at this law firm, you're admitted to this law school, you know, be well. Uh, we have to provide them with some pr a protection and support. And so they would say, well, this is why we have these DEI professionals to provide these students with some support as they navigate this challenging uh, profession. And I think that uh, they would also say, look, uh, we need to have policies in place that protect people against very hurtful and damaging speech. And not all speech is going to add value, they'll say. Would you invite a white suit supremacist to your law school? Would you invite uh, somebody who advocates slavery to your law school. So this whole notion of, oh, let's just have all these viewpoints. Well, some viewpoints are uh, illegitimate, and the presence of these speakers is very damaging and hurtful and threatening to people who maybe are the first in their family to go to law school or the first uh, from a particular group to go to a law school. So we have to support them. And I think the other point that the people on the other side would say is, look, you know, you talk all about the First Amendment. You know, Paul certainly talked about reaffirming the First Amendment. But I think what they would say is, look, the First Amendment is not neutral. It reifies and reinforces existing power differentials. The people who thrive under the First Amendment are the people who already own the television channels and who already own the newspapers and who have a lot of wealth. And given that the First Amendment sort of has baked into it these existing inequalities of power, we need to prevail upon people in authority to protect us and to give our viewpoint a boost because in a very flat uh, sort of, you know, blindfolded marketplace of ideas, we're going to suffer because we don't have the same resources and we don't have the same power. And this is all ultimately about power. And we have a certain power. We have a kind of moral high ground in terms of being able to call you an oppressor. And so that's going to be our power. And I think the final point they would say on this sort of shunning issue is, look, we have First Amendment association rights. And you can say something horrible and hurtful, and that's your First Amendment right, but I don't have to hang out with you. And I don't have to sit in the law school cafeteria with you. And it's my First Amendment right to call you a bigot. And so I'm exercising my form of power and my First Amendment rights to curb your bigotry. So I think that's what some of the people on the other side would say. So I think it's, I'm very glad, David, that you brought this up. These are very important points. And let me give a pitch. There's a conference at Hofstra on Friday on this very subject. and. I wrote a little article, and I, I hope that I responded to every one of those points. But you're absolutely right that we need to we need to flag those points. And I will tell you also, as a professor of First Amendment law, I'm not keen on sort of First Amendment orthodoxy, where everybody just sort of assumes that well, speech should be protected because it's completely harmless. Well, that's not very interesting. The interesting thing is when speech is protected, even when it might be harmful. So I think let me flag a couple of things. One thing is that again, I want to just make sure we focus on what it takes for people to be effective lawyers. And I will say, I'm not going to invite somebody at the law school who is an advocate for slavery, because I just don't think that that's a subject that people are going to be much running into. I mean, I wouldn't expel a student for making that argument, but, uh, but it's certainly not something I would affirmatively try to promote. On the other hand, when some when the country is split again 50-50 or 60-40 or 60-40 against the law school orthodox view, like on, for example, transgender athletes in sports, where the majority view appears to be uh, that transgender uh, athletes should not be able to play in women's sports, you know, I appreciate some transgender students or some friends of transgender students might be upset by even hearing that there. I think that's an important part of a legal education is how you deal with that. Right. Uh, if you if you just can't handle those kinds of arguments, then certainly if you want to work in this field, you're not going to be an effective lawyer for your own position. And more broadly, you're not going to be a, a effective at thinking through how it is that uh, that uh, these important questions, which are obviously very much part of legal debates, are being considered. So I think to the extent that people are in some measure upset by that, I think. One of your jobs as a law student in becoming a lawyer is to figure out how to be less upset. Second point, which is related to that, is of course, to the extent that law schools want to support their students in this kind of situation, 
they're in the best possible position of it, uh, to do that precisely because they're this big institution with a big infrastructure. They can certainly say whatever they want to and need to in order to convey to the students the message, yes, you are welcome here. Yes, we think, we think that, that uh, uh, you deserve to be treated equally. At the same time, you know, you need to hear all of these arguments. This, this group has apparently done a very good, very effective job of advocating the contrary view. We need to, that everybody needs to have at least the opportunity to hear that. I think it's certainly possible to convey that. Here's one way of, here's one way of thinking about it. Let's look at my own group, Jews. So there are militantly anti-Israel statements out there, a lot of which people suspect with good reason are anti-Semitic. You know, I certainly can see how some Jews, and especially how some, let's not look at ethnicity, but just of national origin, some people who are born in Israel, whose parents are from Israel, certainly many Israeli Americans, even setting aside Jews, uh, in more generally uh, in, uh, in America, who might be really upset at hearing all these awful things uh, uh, that are viewed as anti-Israeli. And I think we could say, look, you know, we are committed to protecting you against violence. We're committed to protecting you against discrimination. But, you know, we are not in the business of protecting you against these views. And finally, this question of power. I think it's tremendously important to keep in mind power relationships. With that, I agree on, with, uh, with the left. That, that is certainly something the law has long considered. Um, and the powerful entities at law schools are, generally speaking, the left. So it may very well be that these minority groups are somewhat less powerful, not by any means entirely powerless, as we can see from American politics, but less powerful in the, among the public at large. But at law schools, they, together with those who are willing to go to bat for them, are actually quite powerful. Uh, so to say, well, we are powerless, therefore you should suppress the student's speech, it seems to me is kind of contradictory because... If you are able to suppress your enemy's speech, you can't be that powerless now, can you? Um, so I think if you really focus not at the country at large, which is not where these debates are happening, they're debates at law schools. I think what's happening is at law schools, it is many law schools, it is generally the conservative voices that are not completely powerless, but are somewhat less so. It's generally, for example, the conservative religious voices that are somewhat less powerful. I'm not saying that that means we need to give them special protection beyond what we would give others. But I do think that that makes it hard to say that somehow we need to, in order to protect uh, minority groups, we need to keep these these the speech from even being exposed. Yeah, and I just add two quick thoughts on that, um, if I could. One is, I mean, you know, David, you may have ca you know, encaptured the sort of a good summary of what some people would say about sort of the the law school situation. But I, I don't know that, you know, I don't know of a, a law firm, maybe you do, but I don't know of a law firm that would just openly say, uh, FedSoc members not welcome here. I, 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 and I think they would be offended if you said that's really your policy. They'd be, no, 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 we welcome a variety of intellectual diversity. So if, if, if there's really is that much of a gap between the actual experience and what people would be willing to articulate, well, you know, then, then maybe the problem's not as much at the law school as it is with the law firms, who knows? Um, but that seems to be a real problem. The second thing I just wanted to say, and, and in, a, in a way, I think this is almost like a corollary of what Eugene was saying about the importance of bringing debate to the law school campuses in the 60-40 context, but not in the 95-5 context, which is a lot of what you would say about sort of, you know, we don't need to have a white supremacist here. We don't need to have somebody who is a advocate of slavery, you know, on, on those like, you know, 95.5, 99.1 issues. I mean, that, that all is, I think, an acceptable argument, but if the same argument then is made on issues that are 60-40 or maybe 40-60 and encapsulate essentially most of what a majority of the Supreme Court currently thinks, then we have a real problem in the long run. Because if our law students are basically being taught that what the Supreme Court is deciding is the law is illegitimate, then I just don't see a good way to promote respect for sort of judicial legitimacy in the long run. And I do think, you know, through most of, you know, my legal career, um, you know, the court was, you know, not as conservative as it is today. And it would, you know, from time to time very much frustrate conservatives 
but I, I didn't I didn't sort of perceive the same kind of attack on the legitimacy of the court that I perceive in some of the rhetoric today. And I, and I do think that's a real problem for the profession. And I think, you know, we have to, to, to the judge's question about, you know, are, are students making friendships across the aisles? I mean, I, I think what we need is friendships across the aisles, you know, have always been important at moments where some aspect of the legitimacy of the profession was at issue. You know, when, when people were criticizing people for representing Guantanamo detainees, it was important for conservative lawyers to essentially have the back of the lawyers who were representing the detainees and were being attacked from the right. And so on in disputes where somebody was representing an unpopular position uh, that was being attacked from the left. And you would have lawyers on the left sort of saying, no, this is in the finest traditions of our profession. And I think we need that both for the lawyers and for the judges, or we're going to have a real problem in the long run. I want to respond uh, quickly to Paul's first point, if I may, uh, his point that at very few law firms would somebody on the hiring committee say, well, FedSoc members aren't welcome here. Well, um, that's not how it's done, right? Usually it's not done by these absolute pronouncements. We won't hire anyone from the federal society. Uh, same thing in law schools. You know, the same dynamic happens in law schools. This is done uh, by people coming up with other reasons not to hire this person. Uh, and it may be, in fact, because uh, they are uh, conservative, uh, but they they mention something else, you know, um, uh, not hardworking enough. I mean, you name it. On, on law school faculty, this happens all the time. Uh, so people who may be uh, conservative or, or even moderates uh, on law school faculties, uh, people on faculties don't want to hire them, and they won't come out just come out and say outright, well, it's because they're conservative, or we suspect that they're not a, a left a progressive person. They won't say that. They'll come up with some other reason. Oh, this article was co-authored, and so we have to wonder how much uh, that person really contributed, you know, this kind of thing. So let me uh, turn to some of the questions that have been submitted. Uh, to what extent does, uh, so this is basically the role of government, uh, if there's a role of government question. To what extent does the existence of speech codes on universities generally contribute to, perhaps, or even the genesis of this incivility and tolerance? Should any legal sanctions, for example, denial of federal student aid or use of federal student loans be used to pressure even private universities to abrogate speech codes? Anybody wanna jump on that? Well, speech codes are bad. Uh, they are, uh, um... Uh, they uh, are not currently illegal except in California. Um, there are interesting questions. If you do want to prohibit speech codes or attach conditions on funding, what do you do about institutions that really are overtly ideological, predominantly religious, not to be an institution, uh, usually not a law school, although sometimes, but some other institution says, yes, you know, we don't want people to say things that are contrary to our view of Christianity or whatever else. Uh, um, you might say, well, those institutions shouldn't be able to get any student loan funds and such. I'm skeptical. So it's an interesting question, what legal rule you might want to have. In California, for example, the rule is private universities can't institute speech codes, but um, uh, uh, but there's an exception for religious universities. So you could imagine similar rules being adopted, but I don't think that, uh, that that's, the, that's the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is uh, is uh, more cultural, both among students and among the administrators. There are lots of levers short of formal punishment that's, that uh, administrators uh, have um, uh, if they do want to suppress speech. Uh, and uh, so I think, I think it's hard to see a law-based solution to these problems, it seems to me. All right, another question. How can outside organizations support law school administrators and deans to promote civility amongst student groups? Can I can I make one suggestion? I was gonna ask Renee because she's, but if not, I, I can, uh, but because she, she has uh, experience with this, but uh, let me make one suggestion. If you were thinking of donating money to your law school, 
you might think, what can I do to donate money to law school in a way that will actually help uh, help promote good things rather than bad things? So for example, if you want to, to donate a chunk of money and can find a conservative law professor at the school and then say to the dean, look, you know, I'm donating this money to put on a speaker series uh, or a panel, a debate series, where there's going to be a committee of two people, one conservative, one liberal, who will choose good people to, to, to give these talks. Seems to me that that would help. And I think many a dean would say, well, all right, fine. You know, we wouldn't do much of this ourselves, but we're getting money and we can put on these events and kind of uh, help. Um, uh, it'll help promote us with other alumni, perhaps, or something like that. Seems to me that would be that would be helpful. Uh, how how many deans will actually accept that uh, of the sort that aren't already doing it themselves? That's a harder question. Uh, but I think that's the sort of thing that I would recommend to some people, assuming they have good enough connections to the to the school that they can kind of pitch this to them and and trust the the school's commitments if the school says yes. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, one way that it, it you really might be able to help is by. Uh, sponsoring speaker series where you have people from different views and debating it. Um, currently, uh, Federal Society at many law schools does do this. Um, uh, so they do uh, you know, promote debates with, with people with different views. It's not all conservatives and libertarians. Um, so uh, that's helpful. Uh, but Eugene, I gather that what you're saying is uh, it's better if it's coming from the law school administration yes. rather than the Federal Society. Of course, the Federal Society, as we've seen, um, uh, as I've described, uh, can be uh, disrupted or right. uh, attendance at these events can be discouraged. Right. Um, but that may be more difficult if it's an initiative that's coming from the law school administration. Uh, exactly right. And uh... Uh, that uh, you'd think that, they, that at least they would feel some more pressure to try to respond uh, to disruptions. And also, I think just the message that, that this is an important and legitimate thing for people to talk about. You don't have to agree with either side. Presumably, you'll disagree with one or the other. Uh, maybe you'll disagree with both. But this is something that we as the institution are saying you as students should be thinking about and thinking about what both sides are saying, regardless of what your position is. I think that itself is potentially a useful message to say. Here's a, another question. To what degree do panelists think that the coddling issue is an elite problem versus societal? Uh, students at Yale, Harvard, et cetera, are much more likely to come from wealthy elite families than students at Dayton Law or some other regional school. I think there's some truth to that, but I would also say that these things do permeate the entire hierarchy of law schools. So sure, you have these issues at Yale, but then you also have them at Hastings, which is lower ranked, or the Jason Kilborn situation that we've referenced. This is, by the way, a situation involving a professor who got in trouble for having on a final exam an employment discrimination hypothetical where the plaintiff was referred to using the N-word and the B-word, and he redacted those terms on the exam, but merely for referring to them in the exam hypothetical, he basically got subjected to discipline. But that happened at UCI. Um, which is also not a very highly ranked law school. So does it happen more often at so-called elite institutions? Probably, but I would also say you have lots of incidents that do not involve these schools. Any uh, final comments before we wrap up? Uh, well, first of all, let me just thank the panel. I thought this was a fascinating conversation, a lot of interesting ideas, and hopefully we'll be good father for fodder for future uh, discussion. Uh, Alita, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, and, and, and I agree. I, I think this was um, a, a, a really productive conversation and, and um, you know, five panelists in an hour and a half. And yet I think we covered the landscape really effectively and, and everyone brought some really important insights. Um, so on behalf of the Federalist Society, I would like to thank our panelists and moderator for their time and expertise today, and thank our audience for joining, participating in the event, and also submitting some really great questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fedsoc.org. 
As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming events, especially in this case, since this is the first in a series, please watch carefully for our next installment, which, um, which will address how, how this is affecting um, the preparation of law, clerk, law clerks um, working for judges. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.